Okay, welcome to the 75th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Nikki Moxie. Nikki is an author, an amateur historian, and archaeologist who lives in the middle of rural Suffolk, UK. She is currently writing and editing a book about boarding school and has published several historical fiction books. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you, Piers, and thank you for inviting me. Well, a pleasure. Our paths crossed uh, last year at the Boarding School Survivors Conference. I think I was putting up poems on the, the wall at the time. And I got sent some of the new book you're writing uh, yeah. by Susan Zedike. And I was wow. like, oh, this is amazing. So I thought, oh, I'd love to, to speak to you. So yeah. Thank you for agreeing to come and speak. So I have the first question I like to ask people is, what drew you into the work you now do? Into the book? Um, I retired from a, a very corporate career in BT in April 2019 and went walkabout. I never travelled as a kid. so And I was sitting in a hotel in Thailand in January uh, 2020, talking to a chap from Wuhan and listening to the to the BBC news, the World Service in the background and thinking, I ought to get home right now. Got home just before lockdown. My daughter, who was living at home with me at the time, brought COVID home from her work. I didn't bring it from Thailand. She brought it from Ipswich and we were both ill. So the first lockdown didn't bother me, but the second lockdown slammed me right back into boarding school. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a comprehensive nervous breakdown with just enough survival instinct to Google boarding school therapist, found the BSS who set me up with a therapist who saved my life, I think, five times. I was very suicidal at the thought of that, that captivity again. And then went on one of Nick Duffel's uh, workshops, boarding school survival workshops. And at the end of that, the, the, the bunch of us on the course all said that we'd read things like Enid Blyton and Mallory Towers. And we wanted to put together a book of our own stories to, to, to counteract that to some extent. And as the author in the group, I got volunteered, you know, here, here's our stories. And I, I collected these stories using the same format that the workshops do. So you describe your pre-boarding school life mm -hmm. and then the thing that tips you into knowing boarding school is, is, is a problem. Mm -hmm. And a, a few other people volunteered stories as well. And looking at them, it became very clear that about two thirds of the people who had the most severe problems were from overseas. And that, that led me down this, this current rabbit hole of research that I'm on at the moment around what's, what's known as third culture kids. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I hadn't heard of third culture kids. So I had to Google it yesterday and... Uh... I looked it up and yeah, fascinating. Could you share a little bit about third culture kids? What what is it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the term has been around, or at least the understanding of the term has been around since about the 1950s. The American military wondered why children of um, service people serving overseas had much less good outcomes than, than kids who were serving in the States. And they coined the term military brats for people who went overseas. Um, it's also come through as part of a similar concern from the missionary outfit. And that there's actually a whole bunch of missionary literature on the subject and there's the first use of the term third culture kids and so you have military you have missionary and there's a third bracket that that i fitted into which is mercantile where people are posted overseas and generally are sent back to boarding school because the company pays for it 
And it's really interesting talking to people in each of these groups and finding that there is a different culture in each of them that might potentially cause a slightly different outcome in, in boarding school when these kids go to boarding school. Um, and the other thing is, you can compare it against the, the normal, the, the, the run of the run of the mill. You know, if you think of why people send their kids to boarding school, there is old family tradition, people like Alex Renton, where it just goes back, you know, for, for a very long time. Perhaps people are from a, a rural place and there's just no schooling around them. Um, might have family ambition. There, there might be some disruption in the family. And, you know, all of these are people who, generally speaking, will be sent to school in, in Great Britain somewhere. Then you've got a whole bunch of people, particularly at the moment, who come from overseas looking for our allegedly much better, much, much wider education than they can uh, they can have at home. And I don't know if you've seen the stats that the Independent Schools Commission put out uh, recently, only a week or two ago, about last year's stats. There were something like 61,000 borders in the UK at the moment. Mm -hmm. And of those, 41% are from overseas, places like Hong Kong, Singapore, China. And these kids are termed cross-culture kids in the literature because the expectation is that they will go home. So they come over here, they do their education as far as they want to take it, and then they go back to their, to their home country. Also in those ISC stats are around 8,000 kids who from explicitly military and mercantile backgrounds who can be termed third culture kids. So still today, there's a significant proportion of boarding school people who are, the, the definition of a third culture kid is someone who's spent a significant amount of time living in a culture that isn't their passport culture. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember from, from listening to some of your um, disclosures that you yourself are from a military background. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So my... Have you lived overseas whilst you were boarding at all? No, because it was, uh, I was naval. So, you know, so we were just left. I mean, I think when I was four, three or four, my father went to sea probably for a year and left us at home wow you know uh so we didn't i think it was kind of the 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 army or the air force i think used to travel but i think the navy in those days i know it's changed now that you can't have someone being stationed to sea for a long period of time but then it was up to a year um, 15 months that you would be stationed away mm. so so yes i was military i think most of my family my grandfather on my father on my mother's side was army but all my other relatives were all navy mm. and so I, you don't count as a, as a third culture kid yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but i do because i grew up in africa and was sent to boarding school from there right well, yeah. where in africa were you uh, nikki i was born in kenya Okay. And I, I had the most idyllic childhood. My my father was an honorary game warden, mm -hmm. and I spent as much time as possible out in the, in the in the sticks on safari, and as little time as possible in school. I, I I'm barefoot at the moment uh, because I didn't own a pair of shoes other than dressing up shoes until basically I came to boarding school. So, so coming over, uh, we moved to Zambia when I was 10 and that was that was much less mm. lovely um, because I'd lost the, uh, the, the game reserves, but still, you know, great climate, wonderful countryside, brilliant, brilliant people. And then England, which England at the, at the end of September, 
beginning to get cold, grey, right in your face. Yeah, it, it was not good. And that kind of dislocation is really common among third culture kids. Mm -hmm. D do you know the term hefted, the sheep farming term? It's it's oh. where you imagine a farmer who's got a, a bunch of sheep out on a open moorland. Mm -hmm. How do his sheep know that this patch is theirs and the patch a bit further along is the next herds and, and don't mix? Mm -hmm. It's because that they are hefted. They become rooted in, in a particular soil type, in a particular microclimate so that this, this small place is theirs. And I think part of the dislocation that third culture kids have mm -hmm. is that, you know, growing up in Africa, for instance, it gets dark at six o'clock at night, it gets light at six o'clock in the morning, bang. Mm -hmm. In Zambia, it rains for one month in the year and it's dry for 11 months. The soil is is bright, bright red. You, the, the dust has got a particular smell. And all these things become normal, become part of, of your, your, your biosphere, you know, what, what, what's right, what's normal for you. And then you move to another part of the world and life is subtly wrong immediately. Whatever other insults the world throws at you, you, you are not in the right place. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the differences? So the US military noticed that these third cultures, kids weren't fitting in. Mm. What, what were they noticing? What are you thinking? They made a film that you can catch bits of on YouTube called Military Brats. And on there, there, there is several clips that made me go, oh, yes, I know that one. There's a girl who goes to a new school and she's sitting at the table with a bunch of other kids and they say, where are you from? And she says, well, wh what do you mean? Where I was born, all the places I've lived my favorite place where i am now you know define from and you know i i i know exactly that the military people as you say army and and raf particularly tend to have postings in three year chunks mm -hmm. so you turn up on on a base of some kind these people are your tribe because they understand things like honor and patriotism that may not be the norm outside um, and the turnover of people is quite fast so you learn to make friends very quickly and these friendships can be quite deep some people hold those friendships for many many years but still you've got this turnover and you are likely to be posted someplace else that could be almost anywhere in the world at the end of, of your parents three three week three year posting there are other characteristics um fathers in the military tend to have a higher than the norm problem with drinking which is interesting oh, and that, my father was an alcoholic so i can oh really go with that mm. i hate it when, when you you meet stats but yes um also there's the uh, the feeling of discipline so if you're perhaps not a very good student or if if your response to boarding school is to rebel against it, you're coming bang up against that cultural norm. Mm -hmm. um, there are some similarities between military and missionary, mm -hmm. um, but missionaries, particularly now, tend to be posted to really hairy parts of the world where there's a war going on or, you know, that that kind of thing. And a missionary child is likely to have been brought up in the faith and knows that their mother and father are doing what they see as God's work. Mm -hmm. They're being sent away so that the, to clear the ground so that the parents get on, get on and do God's work. And, you know, if, if they hate boarding school, they feeling that they cannot write home and say, for heaven's sake, take me away they've got that extra layer of pressure on that it's it's god's work that they're interfering with and then the third one the mercantile the one that i actually know know most about because it was me um 
I, I, I get the impression that we move much more often than the other two groups do. Mm -hmm. And I went to nine primary schools. Do you remember at the boarding school survivors conference, Thurstein Bassett had put up a, what he called a nomad thing, you know, how many times you've moved, how many schools you went to, mm -hmm. how many beds you had. Mm -hmm. I didn't, and he asked for people to fill in underneath what, what their equivalent was. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that because I had no idea at all how many houses we lived in through my childhood. Even the ones that I lived in before I went to boarding school at 11, I couldn't count mm -hmm. because we moved every nine months or so. So making friends is incredibly difficult because why you know that you, you that you're going to be ripped apart from them at any point um i think it's easier for a, a mercantile third culture kid to rebel against boarding school mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to have that that kind of feeling because you're rebelling against daddy's corporate culture rather than anything else and there's also the possibility that you know they're paying they don't really care what school you go to you could potentially swap if you manage to make enough noise um so so there are there are differences and compensations in each of them but what we're finding in the literature is that third culture kids come up quite often as people who are um, self-disclosing as having boarding school damage in a much higher proportion than the general population of boarders. And I think it is this, this thing that you are ripped apart. You, know, you, you have the likelihood of adverse childhood experiences before you get near the insult of boarding school. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's interesting over the years a lot of my clients have been abroad mm. as children and then been sent to boarding school and mm. they haven't seen their parents sometimes up to a year at a time yeah, that's awful isn't it yeah, yeah and the other thing is you get farmed out mm. um and it's an experience that unless you've had it, people just don't get. I remember um a piece in Joy Shavering's brilliant book mm -hmm. where she's talking about a boy not going home or not going anywhere for half term or an exit weekend. And she thinks it's a bad thing for this for this lad. But I remember it as absolute bliss when I had the school to myself because nobody was bullying me it was wonderful they'd all gone away and there were three or four of us who were left rattling around this this school grounds and it, it was bliss and that that sort of subtlety of experience and how to deal with it if that gets brought up in therapy is is really why we're trying to write this book mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah like i said i didn't I know about it because I've worked with people, but I've never associated the the connection. I was thinking as you're speaking a bit of Robert Vercake's work and Posh Boys yeah. talks about the fact that, you know, on a less a, a Mac more of a micro level than a macro level, the, the child leaves. So I left Portsmouth to go to boarding school in Horsham. I mm. never went back to Portsmouth. Mm. And that's what he says. It's like we send these children off to boarding school and they never return they lose the that uh place of birth loses the gift of that child yeah my sister still lives down in portsmouth hmm. i live in yorkshire and i've lived all around the world I, you know, hmm. i'm since i started to do my therapeutic work about 20 years ago i'm much more uh, i've stayed in one place but before that i lived in africa australia france all over hmm. and that's yeah well, I can can resonate so mm -hmm. thank you thank you so I guess there's two ways we could go from here I guess I'd be fascinated to hear first of all about your boarding school experiences and then we'll talk a bit about aces but I'd love for you to share how was it from you for you how old were you mm. when you went I was 11 when I went and yeah, we, we got the entire brochure collection of the Gavita String Trust 
boarding school thingies laid it out on the dining room table and I was asked to choose well what did a 10 year old know so you know I picked one had a pretty cover on it um we turned up my mum and dad came over with me uh three weeks late my my dad never did anything on on anybody's time scale other than his own so I turned up three weeks late everybody else had made friendship groups the only bed left in in the dormitory was um, a bunk bed with uh, metal springs above and a gap about that big for you to slide. Oh, I hated that. I hated that. Yeah, think thinking of of Joy's ABCs. You know that was captivity. I'd have had a better time in a prison cell. Um, and my my father must have written a letter from the airport when, when they left to, in, almost immediately to go back to Zambia. Um, my mother was a secretary, so every other letter I ever received was typed, but this was handwritten in my father's writing. And the housemistress came up to the dormitory to inform me that she'd got this letter from him and in public said that um, he'd written to her to say that if I misbehaved, she had his permission to beat me. And I did not, I did not believe her. I had a great relationship with my father, a very loving one, very close one. Um, and I, uh, I told her that's that's a lie. So she went and got the letter. And I still remember to this day the blow of seeing his handwriting. And I, I'm very chuffed with Minnie Me because I told her that if she ever tried to hurt me, I would hurt her back. And that was pretty much the last of it. It was also, incidentally, the last of any attempt at pastoral care. But, you know, hey, I thought that that was probably a, a good thing. And the, the shock of that sent me into bedwetting and bloody daytime liquor wetting, you know, that reverted to a much younger child. And I must have absolutely stunk. And my, my dorm mates decided to take this into their own hands and to try and give me a, um, a, a cold bath. And I fought them off and they tried again and I fought them off and I tried again. And this went on and on. And I, I can clearly remember um, what I now know is is splitting where I stopped thinking I was part of them and I knew that I was part of something else and that uh, and I at that point kicked one of them down the stairs she was okay but that that violence went went round the school very quickly um, and I got ostracized for seven years pretty much bullied occasionally um people would never hand me anything they'd drop it into my hand because they didn't want to touch me if, if my skirts brushed against someone in a corridor they go <laughs> and and break away so boarding school was pretty bloody crap thank you for sharing sounds horrific yeah um sounds horrific wow and it was an all girls school, Nikki. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the only the saviour for me was that you know I, I have a good brain and I adored lessons. The advantage of an all girls school is that you can do things like maths and physics without people thinking you're dead weird. And I did that, and I did four A levels and went on to uni very well academically prepared, but with zero relational skills. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you yeah and as you share that story about how they treated you it's like I had this I didn't have it towards myself but there was someone on my year there was someone on the year below me in my house every single house and every single year had that one person and I think it's Richard Beard says it's really beautifully says if you look in the group of people in boarding school and you can't see the custos the you know the one who's being bullied it's you mm. and every single year and some of the things i heard and i saw were just horrific yeah. and it was like and the teachers did nothing yeah 
wouldn't see it. Why, why would they? You're being brought up by your peers, by definition, in a boarding school. And that's as true today as it was when I was growing up and when you were. Yeah. I've, yeah. And some people say, oh, no, it's better. And I'm like, I spoke to a head teacher on my podcast and he says, no, the amount of paperwork you now have as a teacher, safeguarding, risk assessment, you don't have any time for the children. So it's even worse. Yeah. So I'd love us to segue into ACEs, mm. Adverse Childhood Experiences. Mm. Let me just share what they are and then you know, linking them into to boarding schools, really. Mm. So, yes, Adverse Childhood Experiences. There's a, there's a list of 10 standard questionnaires or questions in, in this thing. Um, mm. The missionary people have done a lot of work in sort of toning down the adult language of these for childhood interviews. So that there is now a direct link across. But I know I've got them on a, on a post-it here. Mm -hmm. um, first one is, were your parents separated? Second was, um, was either of your parents a drinker or into drugs? Mm -hmm. Anyone in prison? Was anyone mentally ill in your family? Did you ever feel unloved? Did you ever feel that you had no protector? Were you ever humiliated or under a lot of stress? Were you hit often as a child? Was your parent themselves abused? Was there sexual abuse in, in your childhood home? Those are the, the, the child questions. And, you know, you look at those and felt unloved how could you feel loved at boarding school no protector again were you humiliated part of the point of boarding school i'm sure is to humiliate and shape a child and the the consequence of having many aces is twofold first of all the more set up you are to fail by these things when you go into boarding school the more chance you have of failing and the more aces you have throughout your 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 life but particularly through that developmental period of childhood the worse your your final outcome is likely to be if you have more than four aces your chance of suicide is 12 times the, the norm your chance of alcohol dependency is seven times chance of of clinical depression is four times and it goes on. If, if you have more than six aces, then you live 20 years on average, less than someone who has none. And so the impact of these things are incredible. And I haven't done an ace questionnaire with everybody I've spoken to, but of the sort of hundred odd people I've talked to over the course of, of, of researching this book, I don't think anyone has had fewer than four. I'm pretty certain that I turned up with four at boarding school and then acquired an extra one or two as, as a result of my experience there. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is thank God for therapy, because yeah. otherwise I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. oh, well, thank you. It's a real blessing you are sharing these, these stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. As you share, I'm, I'm in tears because it's like, yeah, I, I I read through that list and I, I have seven mm. uh, aces, four from home. And mm. no, I think it's three from home and four from boarding school. Mm. And by according to that, you know, which is interesting, I struggled with alcohol in my 20s, tried mm. to take my own life two, three times mm. and clinically depressed. Yeah, yeah, I was mm. very, very depressed and, you know, the plus six, you live 20 years or less. I mean, it's I an average, Pierce. Don't forget. Average, yeah, <laughs> but, but, and I think maybe for me now, I see that when we do work psychotherapy, uh, then, okay, we can change those figures, mm. you yeah. know, those, those statistics. I think reading Gabal Mate's book as well. Mm. Uh, him saying about psychotherapy, the importance. And for me, certain, certainly, certainly, Jungian analysis and my monastic life mm. that really really helped to, to 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 bring a stop to a lot of those things mm. so thank you so 
you know, have you spoken to over a hundred for about hundred people about aces? You know, what what's the data? What what kind of have you learnt about speaking to these people just in general and then in relation to boarding school? People who I've spoken to who are on the older end of the spectrum almost never say that boarding school was an enjoyable experience for them. Mm -hmm. People at the younger end of the spectrum say that it can give them advantages, that they learn stuff. One or two of them come out with that classic <laughs> phrase, it's, it's the making of me. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I tend to throw them over to YouTube and, and, the, and the, the, the video. But, excuse me, recognising damage in oneself, I think uh, Nick's idea of the strategic survival personality um, is absolutely true. And the, um, the, the strength of that is obviously, you know, pretty black and white when you leave school and then you start to see shades of grey as as you get older so i mean that there is a lot of books in the literature in the literature now that give you statistics on boarding school experience i mean the, the the latest one i don't know if you've seen this one yet penny cabiner's one that came out very recently in the last few weeks mm -hmm. um she t she interviewed i think it's 186 people mm -hmm. um this book is bending over backwards to be fair to boarding schools so i disagree quite fundamentally with a lot of their conclusions but still you can see that there is a significant number of of those those self-reporting people they they got their data sample by asking people to get their friends to to come in so if you have someone who enjoyed boarding school and they bring in their friendship group that actually worked, your data sample gets skewed. But still, even in this positive book, there is a horrific amount of pain and, and grief and trauma showing. I've been looking at the, the other books, um, Margaret Lawton's Men's Accounts mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. to work out um, so, uh, but specifically with respect to which of the people in it were third culture kids, mm -hmm. uh, and again, there's uh, there's a, about a half to two thirds of people fit into the bracket. A similar amount in Nikki Simpson's um, girls stories thing. Mine is the same. Um, Penny's book is slightly less because she doesn't the, the the data doesn't allow you to separate properly people who um are are these uh, cross culture kids who mm -hmm. live overseas from third culture kids that are typically british but are bouncing backwards and forwards but in the, there seems to be throughout the literature a preponderance of people who are third culture kids and we're beginning to feel that we have it worse than than other people simply because of the the the, the poor start the that the the ripping away this this biological setting that you become used to and the 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 end result for people seems to be that we're really really unrooted and without a root without without some kind of grounding it's very difficult to, to to find a way of repairing the, the personality issues that the you know the particularly um the relational issues that boarding school leaves you with and so we suspect we don't know because there's no data on it we suspect that the end result for third culture kids is worse than for any other group of boarding school people mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you so with the the aces then on average what would you say how many aces in general do does boarding school create in the you know the the one to ten is there but a... i think i suspect it's the ones i highlighted the the felt unloved mm, yeah yeah you, you've got that abandonment um mm. thing just just absolutely to start with mm. uh no protector 
Yeah. Even in, in, I think, the most benign of boarding school experiences, there must be times when your hurting peers want to hurt you and without a protector, particularly if it happens on, on multiple occasions, you acquire that ace. And then the humiliation or, or shame. You know, I, I, I've not spoken to anyone ever who couldn't recall some, some incident of humiliation and shame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously these things happen in day schools as well. But in day schools, you can go home and you can process that, mm -hmm. even if all you're doing is, you know, sitting in a room upstairs playing your, your video games. You know that if you if you wanted to, there are people downstairs who you could talk to, whereas, you know, a boarding school kid is stuck there. The, the captivity of uh, uh, aspect of it is is just bang in your face all the time mm -hmm. yeah yeah is that so? the, the other thing Piers, is that the younger you are the less sense of time you have mm -hmm. so you know a four-year-old might be able to make it to lunchtime conceptually mm -hmm. uh, an eight-year-old which you know I, I suspect you were when you were sent to boarding school following the usual trend Actually, because my father was invalided out of the Navy because of alcoholism, um, they couldn't afford to send me. So I went to 11. Oh, I think okay. I would have been. All of my friends went. Yeah. Hopefully, I, but... I think you're lucky. Well, how long can an eight year old think? You know, maybe to the end of the week. Mm -hmm. An 11 year old, you know, if you're lucky, you know, perhaps a month. And here these kids are banged up for you know, three months at a time. Mm. There is there is no hope. You have no hope of getting out until you start drawing. Did you do guys do those caterpillar things where you counted off the, the last few days of term? No, I don't think so. I think we, oh, all, we all knew we all knew because it was an open dormitory, so we all knew that and there was some excitement. It's like, oh yeah, going home, going home. Mm. We, we couldn't show the excitement, but but yes, yes, I um, I definitely remember remember mm -hmm. that. But um, I think yeah, I can't remember. There were certain things which were different. You know, it's like you'd get lessons on a Saturday would finish at ten thirty rather than twelve thirty, so you get an extra two hours, and you could go off. And, mm. But I live too far away, so I had to. My parents had to come to me or if you were playing sport then you would not go go home for mm. your leave day um so mm. yeah and i can resonate and with all of those the protection and i think one people one thing people miss i feel a lot with boarding school is that they say well it didn't happen to me but i'm like did you see any it happened to anyone else and um i think it's Judith Herman in her book, um, Trauma and Recovery, she says, actually, it can be even worse if you're watching someone being bullied or beaten up, which we all watched, um, because it's that helplessness that you can't help them. Mm. And, you know, and guilt because you're complicit just by watching. Exactly, exactly. And yet you know that if you were to stand in and do something, you're next. You will be you know ostracized mm -hmm. uh, so i can resonate with that the protector um you know uh, and also the you know the humiliation yeah i saw that i think having you know open showers no space mm -hmm. it's like that constant thing of people laughing because they're they're hurting children mm -hmm. yeah absolutely anything that's different mm -hmm. No, I think it's the NSPCC which says, you know, neglect is the ongoing failure to meet a child's basic needs yeah. and the most common form of child abuse. Yeah. And I was speaking to a friend who was at school with me and she says everyone she speaks to, she's a therapist, saying, oh, yeah, they resonate with the word neglect. Yeah, mm. it was neglect. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I guess... You know, I'd love for you to share a bit about your your book, what your, you know, what is happening with it and, you know, how has that journey been and, you know. 
heart wrenching in 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 a in a huge number of respects because every single story, every person who tells you their story, it absolutely hits you. I can't tell you how long I've spent crying, not while I'm talking to someone, but afterwards, because their stories are just so awful. And anger is something that I bottled up at school very early. It did me no good, so I killed it. But I am absolutely able to be furious on behalf of other people and the neglect, the, 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 uh, the pain that people had. So the, the arc of the book mm. is um, to, to look specifically at or to, to look at third culture kids um, in in context, so we have fourteen women's stories, mm -hmm. and the the, the two thirds of them are third culture, and we have kids from across all three of those those third culture types, and we also have people who were sent because their families were in some kind of disruption, um, somebody who chose to go who finds it actually a positive experience. Um, a, a couple of old family tree type people who who's actually sent girls for a number of generations um, to try and put third culture kids in context. And then wrapping around that, I've got some wonderful collaborators. You mentioned Suzanne Zedijk, who's write, written me a, a great chapter on attachment theory, specifically as it, as it relates to children growing up rather than the, the, the very young infant thing. Um, there's a, a, a lady called, uh, a research professor called Linda uh, Devereaux, who is based in Canberra in Australia, mm. who was herself a missionary kid and has written about the, the, the shape of third culture kids from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. I have um, a, a, a mystery therapist who's writing me a, a, a chapter, I hope we still haven't quite got to the point where, where that's, that's a certainty, uh, about how, you, how it helps if you approach particularly third culture kids with that extra layer of issue. Um, Nick talks about people running away at the point where therapy is going to do good. And it feels like third culture people have even more of that urge to do that. Mm. And then finally, there's a, a chapter by a lady called Ulrika Envik, who's, who's written, yeah, written a, a, a great book on, on the subject. Wow, okay. And Ulrika has concentrated on how you can build resilience. So the book is aimed certainly at a, at a boarding school interest audience, but also I hope at parents. So that if as a parent, you you decide that despite reading this, this book, you actually need to send your child to boarding school, Ulrika's chapter tells you how you can build resilience, how you can put positive childhood experiences in to try and buffer your child, to try and turn around some of this, this very poor outcome that we've talked about earlier. Mm, thank you. It sounds fascinating. Mm. And there it is. I, I'm I'm waiting for the, for mystery therapist to to do her her piece, and um, and then I'm going to uh, uh, take a second shot at submitting it to Routledge. Because mm. I think Penny Cabiner's book cut across the 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 bows of of my first attempt, but now that one's out, I'm, I will I will go again and see how we go. Mm, mm, yeah, and well, if Routledge don't want to play, then there are plenty of other options. I think so. I think it's it's a you know I think it's Thurston Bassett who says this is one of the fastest growing absolutely markets at the moment, especially mm -hmm. in therapy, um, because more and more people are realizing, oh my god, I have all the symptoms of boarding school syndrome. I was talking last week to a professor, retired professor, about neglect. As he was saying the common symptoms of neglect, I said, that's exactly the symptoms of boarding school syndrome, mm. almost precisely. Mm. And I think more and more people are starting to, to become aware of this. Mm. Uh, so it sounds great. Um, you know, as you said, if you decide to send your child to boarding school, part of me is like, no, no, don't do it. <laughs> Educate them locally, you know. Um, Absolutely. But there, there, there are still 
Mm. I mean, if, if you were a missionary, for instance, and you were sent to the Congo, mm. you probably wouldn't want your child educated locally. Mm -hmm. if you were a military person serving in guam you might not want your child if you if there's there's a horrible divorce going through you you can I, yes out of my entire year one person has sent their child to boarding school and i love that trend but if you have to for heaven's sake find ways of of making the experience survivable for them Mm. so that's your year at boarding school someone sent their child back one 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 person out of the year right i think there's probably more on mine i went back to an open day mm. a couple of months ago and there's one of the girls oh. on my year and she's there with her daughter in uniform i'm like oh my god what are you doing you know yeah. did you not hear about the abuse or the the teachers in prison did you not hear about that yeah <laughs> you do but you know we we have our choices yeah. so i uh, love for you to share a little bit about the book this new book that um penny kavanagh's written because you've, you've read through it in your experience of doing this research because i i haven't read it yet but I've, I've read the the press release and i was triggered a bit by it because it was saying oh boarding school is a good thing and yes i i agree that say 10 to 20 percent of people it, it's a good thing boarding school but it mm. seems to be putting across that, yeah, that it's not, I can't remember the exact wording, but I'd love you to speak a little bit about that if you're comfortable. Mm. Yeah, I had that on pre-order and devoured it the minute it landed on, on my, my doorstep. And yeah, I, it's Penny and, and three or four other editors, mm. um, I think two of whom went to boarding school and two didn't. I might be wrong on, on that. But Penny herself certainly did. Mm -hmm. um, she is a lecturer in the University of East Anglia, just, just down the road from me. And I think I've bumped into her on coffee mornings, that kind of thing. And I think that she is perhaps 40 at, at the most. And I think that she is still in the um, strategic survival personality phase of her life. Mm. Because yes, she talks positively about boarding school. Um, the way they recruited their cohort, which is quite a large one, it's 186 people, I think, was to ask people to pull in their friendship groups. Mm. So you could imagine that someone like Penny perhaps she had a, a bunch of good friends at boarding schools she brings in half a dozen people and your data gets skewed immediately simply by your your recruitment policies and yes I, I disagree with with an awful lot of of her conclusions um because I don't think they're looking at it with a trauma eye that there's um there's an example she actually has a chapter on she doesn't call them third culture kids but but similarly to joy chevarian's exiles chapter and there are two or three people whose interview excerpts there uh, she's quoting in there and you read it and you read her interpretation of it and it feels the same way that that poor little boy Colin in the making of them film was saying, oh, boarding school is going to be really good for me. I can be a stockbroker when I grow up. And that's exactly the feeling that these 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 adults are, are, uh, are, are giving you when you read their pieces. And also, um, I, I, I regret what looks like a very tight privacy policy on her data because I've asked her to uh, to clarify a couple of points in the data a couple of times and she's been unable to do it uh, anonymously of course I, I don't want personalized access to her data mm -hmm. now in in the archaeology or the historical realm that I operate if you write a paper that is a research paper and you don't share your data you don't get funding for the next one it, it, it feels an incredible waste of the work that she's put in that that you know that the, the board anybody who's interested in boarding school can't access this data it, it, it invalidates it mm -hmm. largely for me because you can't explore it you can't dive down into it and that's a shame you know it's 
you know, they obviously put in a lot of time and effort and 186 people have relived potential trauma or or at least their experiences mm. and it, it would be lovely to dive into it and yet we can't mm -hmm. i think thank you thank you that's useful to clarify i think there's one bit in the press um press release talking about boarding schools create resilience yeah right being beaten is is a wonderful way of not being hurt so much next time around no <laughs> Well, what's your sense with that having you know done your research of 100 people talking about aces what's your you know when people say it creates because i've been i'm on a an interview this afternoon myself and someone's asked me the question does boarding school create interdependence and independence and resilience and my answer is no and then but i'd love to hear your opinion based on you know, because obviously the book, it talks about boarding school creates resilience. That's one of the, the phrases I saw in the press release. What do you feel? I think boarding school creates people who are dissociated and deeply hurt inside. And dissociation may well look like resilience because you, you ignore the blows, however hard they fall. And as for independence, uh, that, that's that's the same answer, that you are locked inside your skull. You are relationary, relation, is there? <laughs> you have no relational resilience at all. Um, you, you're, you're damaged goods. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's. And, and to, to qualify that, there, there must be groups of people for whom boarding school is a haven. If home life is, is bad enough, then boarding school must, must be a better option. But I think you quoted a 10 percentage figure earlier, and I think I'd go go along with that. Mm. And presumably, you know, a, a Pareto's analysis suggests that 80 percent of people might muddle through and it's you know the 20 percent who who are damaged. But, you know, 61,000 borders in the UK last year. Um, twenty percent of that is is a large number of damaged people, and that's just one year. You know, it's how long have we been boarding people? Mm. Yeah, and I and I feel you know the ten percent thrive, so that's six thousand. They do okay, but then that for me is fifty five thousand who are damaged. That's you yeah. know from my people say, oh, it was good, but you speak to the the partners who often will contact me in my therapeutic work say can you help me you know they, yeah. they can't connect their emotions they won't do any inner work they won't um mm. they won't give anything emotionally um they say oh i'm i'm fine but actually no the presenting mm. issues so yeah i can i can uh, i can really resonate with that so yeah that's really useful i think have I got any other questions? I mean, are there any other things that you've researched over the last few years that you would love to share? That's like, yeah, yeah, I've had that real insight. I know I get them all the time and I always want to share mine. So what about you? It is the commonality of experience across third culture kids that, that really blew my mind. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm talking to a missionary. I mean, I'm I'm an atheist, so one would would expect there to be little commonality. But truly, we, we, we had the same childhood and the same with with a military kid. Mm. And the, the thing that often underpins it is is freedom. And then uh, uh, Joy's um, abandonment, bereavement, captivity, trial, trial <laughs> thing, just just fits so so perfectly well. Mm. That you you whatever your childhood was, going to boarding school it, it disrupts what you might have been, mm -hmm. and and that that loss of your inner child or perversion of it sometimes is is the heartbreak mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you so much for your work nikki um really appreciate and you know the book if i can support anyway when it's coming closer 
you know if you want to come on again uh, on the podcast to uh, to talk about it or send it to me and I'll uh, put it out but yeah I think it's amazing work I, I just love more and more people are speaking up and going yeah this is what happened yeah mm, that's very kind of you Piers thank you mm, my pleasure pleasure any last things you'd like to say before we wrap up I'd like to salute the bravery of the people who've been talking to me, who've been giving me their stories, mm -hmm. because it does require dodging around that strategic personality and, and reliving childhood trauma. And I'm very, very appreciative of their bravery. Mm -hmm. Thanks to all those people. Bless you for, for doing that. So, yeah, thank you so much. And I will put a link to your website and to buy your books in the description um, because I know you do your um, historical fiction books as well. So uh, uh, a complete contrast, yes, a complete <laughs> contrast. But yeah, they look amazing. So thank you so much. Okay, take care.